The Louisiana event scrapbook was a collection of literature which is supposed to provide evidence and background information for the mysterious Louisiana event. The fragmentary nature of the scrapbook means that the information found therein is up for interpretation and indeed is fun to have a go at playing detective and using the articles, journals and historical paraphernalia to piece together what exactly the Louisiana event was. This is exactly what I've attempted to do in this video by looking at each page of the scrapbook in turn and seeing exactly what is said and then looking at historical context and trying to glean what is the purpose of each piece of information that is provided. By the end of the video, I will share my conclusions, but of course this is my personal interpretation which will just be one of many valid theories to exist, so feel free to share your own thoughts in the comments if you wish to do so. A further point to this, these documents have also been removed from the game since it was in its early access build. Maybe this was due to the real life links with actual people being named or to add to that overall mystery of what happened. That or a storyline was going to be in the game but got dropped in later builds. However, I still think this whole scrapbook paints a picture of what truly is happening or what happened at the start of this outbreak and what has caused the world of Hunt Showdown to be the way it is. Also, a quick warning that some of the language is that of the later 1900s so it might be a bit outdated now and cause some offence. Hopefully you can understand that the articles are of the era and not modern ones. Essentially I am reading their words and not ones I have written myself. Also a big shout out to my lovely wife who helped me with the research, especially the historical stuff, and helped me come up with some of the conclusions, so give her some love in the comments below. So without further ado, let's begin. This is the mystery of the Louisiana event from Hunt Showdown. The first page consists of just one newspaper article, which reports on the comments made by Governor Murphy J. Foster of Louisiana about rumors of disease outbreak in the bayou, and what that means for the people of the Baton Rouge. The article reads, Governor Foster assures citizens no epidemic. Governor Murphy J. Foster made a rare statement in regard to recent speculations of an epidemic affecting a minority of undesirable populace deep in the bio. We remark that it is rare for him to comment on such tattle. However, as he acknowledged in the statement printed forthcoming, there has been an unusual hysteria clinging to this topic, no doubt stirred up by anarchists and populists out to seed fear into the populace in the run up to the election next year. There are reports of an epidemic, a plague if you will, concerning populace deep in the bio. I refer to this as a flagrant speculation. The people affected by this are no doubt of a low creed. It is not uncommon for their sort to be afflicted by maladies, which we superior men do not need to fear. Claiming such a thing as an epidemic is therefore naught but a misinterpretation of their natural state. This being the case, calls to close the port of New Orleans will go unheard. Good God-fearing folk have my assurance that there is nothing to fear. Governor Foster has gained a reputation of holding dearly the best interests of the people. Indeed, his work today chiefly concerns protecting the best interests of the Louisiana people against threats to democracy posed by carpetbaggers, freedmen and populists. Business interests were rightly assured by the statement, citing how close the port of regulation their constitutional rights to free trade could be threatened, their ability to provide employment. Indeed, Henrik Graff, one such businessman, had this to say. Some of those in my employment have cited malady as cause for idleness, allowing this hysteria to spread amongst the torpid. I will be the first in saying lethargy is the real epidemic, one entertained by the work shy, fundamentally no more than indolence. Further to this, we trace the sources of some of these rumors, finding them to be based in the ramblings of the criminally insane practitioners of voodoo, women afflicted by mania, and the idle poor. We would advise the dear reader to take such stories with a pinch of salt and rely on the words of those who know better. 
This is an interesting article to start with, as its reason for being written was to dispel rumours of an epidemic in the bio, and yet the very fact that it is included in the scrapbook, and perhaps even more importantly, being the first piece of information provided, gives the impression that this epidemic was not mere rumour at all, but in fact could be the very subject of the Louisiana event itself. The protagonist of this article is Governor Murphy J. Foster, who as I revealed earlier actually existed, and this helps date the article to between 1892 and 1900, when the governor was in office. As can be seen in Governor Foster's remarks, his view on the epidemic is full of prejudice, and this would have been typical of the man who was active in the disfranchisement of African Americans and was a supporter of the Louisiana Constitution of 1898. Being so prejudiced and secretarian in his views of who the epidemic could affect, Governor Foster was perhaps willfully blind to the threat of an epidemic as well as being dismissive to those already affected, as he he saw them as unimportant, and it could be reasonably assumed that no help was given to the people in Bio, who were suffering as a consequence of this disease. The other person mentioned is Henrik Graf, a businessman who simply believed that any illness was essentially laziness on the part of his workers. Again, this ignorance would have been conductive to greater spread of any illness, and also the neglect of his workers who may have been genuinely suffering. The newspaper itself is generally complicit in these views, and perhaps therefore the purpose of this article is twofold. First, to prove that an epidemic did exist in the 1890s and that it was ignored by those who had the power to help those afflicted. The next page consists of seven short articles describing events across the United States with the locations of these events handwritten on the article that it references. The first article is from Massachusetts and reports. A queer game has been played in Hollyoak, Massachusetts by the name of Mittenet, featuring knocking a ball back and forth over a net. Seeing the invention of the so-called basketball not four years before in Princeton, one can only wonder how many odd ball games will emerge from this region in the coming century century. The second article is from Washington and says, President Cleveland was heard making the following remark in regards to the Venezuelan boundary controversy. Gold beneath controversial soil does not always hasten the resolution of uncertain or disputed boundary lines. Mysteriously, sometimes they even move. Moving on to the third article, which is from El Paso. The trial of John Selman for the murder of notorious outlaw John Wesley Hardin is ongoing. New testimony was brought forward today asserting that Selman committed multiple rapes during the Lincoln County War. We at the Gazette could not comment on the defendant's clear guilt. Next, we have the fourth newspaper cutting from La Trobe. The first professional game of so-called American football was played here two weeks ago between Latrobe YMCA and Jeanette Athletics Club. Latrobe won 12-0. Could this be the birth of a new American pastime? The fifth article from the New Orleans reads, a new bout of yellow fever has claimed the lives of a hundred citizens over the last several months and shows no sign of slowing down. This could mark the first outbreak in the city since the devastation of 1878, and it's another sorry chapter in the history of a city which has already suffered. Next, we travel to Chicago for the sixth article. The recent Labor Day celebrations were confirmed to be the largest in the country, this being the holiday's first anniversary since its nationwide adoption in the light of the Pullman strike. Finally, we have an article from Atlanta. Booker T. Washington delivered a notable speech today, announcing the compromise in that blacks will receive basic education and due process, while the whites will continue their rule of the southern whites, thereby ending decades of agitation in the tiresome pursuit of equality. If you are particularly well versed on American history, then you might have spotted what all of these clippings have in common. They all refer to real events that happened within one year, namely the year of 1895. The game of Mintonette, a precursor to volleyball, was invented by William Morgan on the 9th of February when he started throwing a soccer ball over a badminton net. That same year, the United States government led by President Cleveland intervened in a territorial dispute between Venezuela and British Guiana over the area of Essequia. 
Weibo. John Selman killed John Weasley Harding by shooting him in the back of the head, supposedly in self-defense on August the 19th, 1895. The first professional American football game was indeed played between Latrobe and Jeanette in September of 1895, but the professional part doesn't refer to the teams, but rather a particular player, John Brellier, who was the first person to be paid to play American football. He was paid $10 a game plus some cake the most important thing. Labor Day was first celebrated in its current form in 1895 as a way of paying respects to workers after the strike of Pullman factory workers the previous year when their wages were cut by their rents and were not amended accordingly. And Booker T. Washington did indeed present the Atlanta Compromise in 1895. The compromise was so called because even though African Americans finally achieved the right to an education, not a college education however, and the right to due process process, but had to agree to give up the fight for the right to vote, accept segregation, and not fight back if they were racially attacked. What this page seems to be doing is presenting an overview of what was going on in the United States, specifically in the year 1895, and the reason why is probably to do with the fifth article from New Orleans, which describes a yellow fever epidemic. This possibly ties in with the previous page's article, where Governor Foster denied that any diseases from the bio were dangerous. Here in 1895, that seems to have changed and the disease was reported as being yellow fever. The next page contains another newspaper cutting. However, unlike the previous pages, this article is not from the 1890s, but rather from 1977. The subject is graffiti, which on first appearances seems to be taking us on a complete tangent of what has been the theme of the scrapbook so far. But let's see what it says before we make our minds up. As such street art is by no means unique to our century, once dismissed as the lunatic ravings of wannabe young gangsters, graffiti is on its way to claim its rightful place as a true art form of the punk era. Treating cave painting as graffiti might be seen as stretching the definition a little bit, but precisely that is truly what they are says Dr. Klein and adds, We have graffiti in ancient Ephesus, in Pompeii and Rome. Dr. Klein firmly believes street art has had a continuous existence ever since our ancestors learned to produce paint. This assumed genesis of graffiti in the New York subways assumes not only a narrow definition of street art, but is also flat out wrong. Aerosol cans and hip hop do not define graffiti. They can merely be another page in this massive book. Dr. Daniel Klein and his team are currently working on uncovering examples of street art from the late 19th century. Their research revealed particularly interesting examples from New Orleans. We were fortunate in this case. These photographs were found in a private collection. The owner, one Rebecca Collingwood, had them donated to our university before passing away. To the untrained eye, these examples of late 19th century American graffiti may seem like unintelligible gibberish, but Dr. Klein seems convinced there is a method to the madness. We do believe they at least share a common semiological ancestry. The signs appear to possess similar characteristics. Whether it was its own micro language or own random art remains to be seen. Interestingly, they all seem to be related to the pseudo language seen in. The article breaks off, which is frustrating as we can't know the pseudo language that is being referenced here. However, we can now see the connection between this article and the previous, which is New Orleans, Louisiana, and the late 19th century. Clearly, whoever put together this scrapbook felt that these unintelligible writings were linked to the aforementioned illnesses. Perhaps those who were infected were writing, or perhaps the infection was being caused by a person or group of people who were using a secret language to communicate. It must be noted that this graffiti is also the same logo for the American Hunters Association who were around in this era, which immediately gives us a big clue that maybe this whole language was created by this hunting society. What I find interesting about this is this private collection was donated to the graffiti gallery in 1977 but then suddenly the person donating it died. Could this be that the AHA were hiding what truly happened back in 1895? Did they create this language as a form of control or something more sinister and are they still active in 1977 looking to take out any information that is put out there about their organization? But whatever is going on is quite clear from this graffiti that the American Hunters Association were there on the scene, and this was their own language of some sort, their tag, if you will. 
There could be other reasons, but we will need to know more about this scrapbook to have any ideas. The next pages move us on from the newspaper articles that we've previously seen, and here we see two letters. The first is written by Dr. Philip Huff Jones, who was the assistant superintendent of the insane asylum of Louisiana near Jackson, to Madame Laveau, who was a Louisiana Creole practitioner of voodoo, as well as being a herbalist and midwife. The second letter has been sent by Dr. Jones, but this time from a V. Caldwell, a gunsmith. We'll look at each letter individually to see how they build on what we've learned so far. The first letter starts with an annotation saying, from Jones's collection, and then continues. Most esteemed Madame Laveau, I was honoured to receive your letter. I have indeed heard of you. You are correct in saying I wear a mask of sorts. I have taken an oath to maintain the secrecy of the AHA, and would I break it, I would not survive to gloat. In a sense, it is both mask and shield, but if even half of what I have heard about you is the truth, then you likely know of what I speak. I have consulted with several of my colleagues on the matter, and we are of one mind. A partnership between us would be of benefit to all. I would hear more of your visions of the city's end, for we have also seen such things. But there are also portents as well. I dare not comment more to paper. Let us meet and discuss this further in person. The coming months are, in our estimation, crucial. Please write me at your earliest convenience. Quam parva sampentia mundus recitur. Philip Huff Jones, MD. The letter then has another annotation saying, who's transcribing these? Find originals. The last annotation is interesting as it implies that there might be some error in the transcription, so anything we read into the letter might have to be taken with a pinch of salt. However, to take the letter as read for the first time being, we can see that it reveals Dr. Philip Huff Jones as a member of the AHA, the American Hunters Association, and that the association has to remain secret, but to its members. Secondly, we find that the AHA is willing to work with Madame Laveau as both Dr. Jones and Madame Laveau have foreseen something to do with the end of the city, and then there are other signs which are showing this future as well. However, it is apparently too risky to have more information written down. Finally, the Latin phrase at the end of the letter translates to, how little wisdom governs the world. Perhaps a cynical observation, but also sounds slightly threatening, as in the world is easily fooled. The final thing to note about this letter is that Madame Laveau died in 1881, so this letter predates all of the articles about what was going on in 1895. So does the calamity that Laveau and Jones foresee have something to do with the epidemic of the 1890s? I think this letter is interesting as well, as once again we have another mysterious death around the 1880s, when rumours of a destroyed city were raising their head. The fact that Laveau dies in 1881 could be due to once again the AHA getting involved, silencing what she knows about what was happening. That, or they truly did recruit her to use her specialty in voodoo to help their cause. The reason I say this theory is because of that annotated note from the scrapbook owner, who clearly thinks this letter has been changed or mistranslated. To me, this screams that there was more going on and Laveau was in too deep, exploring something she shouldn't. That or the AHA asked her to truly get involved in this event, and maybe if she didn't help them, that would be her end. It's a stretch, but there's certainly something interesting about the fact that the transcript is being questioned and Laveau died after raising these concerns to this secretive organization. The second letter also has some annotations, starting with transcript found inside a French-German dictionary Berlin Public Library. But the letter reads, Most esteemed Dr. Jones, I can now confirm that the first shipment is underway and I have been promised, should I arrive in Louisiana before the month is out, this shipment is perhaps of a bizarre and even whimsical character, as it contains prototypes for a highly experimental nature. I tire of working toward a non-existent perfection and long to create something truly original. But my father values business over art, and I find the ideas shattered against the wall of his obstinance. My favor with him deteriorates further with each new design. I hope in your hands they will receive the appreciation I believe they deserve. Should this be so, I can provide you with more, so much more. There are designs of which I have not dared to speak, and I begin to suspect you will be the first with whom I can discuss my plans. I need not call your attention to the 
sign of the times. This evil of which you speak follows us both in various forms. We must all face down our own demons, though what you face sounds to be of a particularly vile nature. Your own brilliant prospects must be realized, for it is not fate which makes such men as yourself. You make your own fate. There is, however, such a thing as compelling fortune, however reluctant or reverse. As regards myself, perhaps I too will succeed. So let us both keep a good heart and to work together toward our mutual success with sincere esteem and friendship. V. Caldwell. A final annotation says, V. Caldwell? which seems to confirm that this letter was indeed written by Victor Caldwell, the gunsmith, who was also a member of the AHA. The first thing to question about this letter is that it was found for some reason in a French-German dictionary of the Berlin Public Library. The French part can be deduced to be to do with the prevalence of French speakers in Louisiana. So was someone from Germany, and they have to be from Germany as the letter was found in Berlin rather than a native German speaker in America, must have been in Louisiana and found this letter, taking it back to Berlin and then left it in their library borrowed dictionary. Remember, all of this for later. The content of the letter revolves around Caldwell having sent something experimental to Dr. Jones, most likely a gun of some sort considering Caldwell's profession. The tone of this letter still seems rather inductory, so perhaps this was the beginning of Caldwell and Dr. Jones's acquaintance, perhaps before the AHA was started or at least before Caldwell joined it. Further to this, it could also, like the letter to Madame Laveau, be from before the epidemic of 1895. Caldwell also references that Dr. Jones has mentioned some evil that is around, although Caldwell writes in a way that implies that he has not taken Dr. Jones's thoughts literally, which Dr. Jones seems to be more sure about in the letter to Madame Laveau. However, by the fact that Dr. Jones has requested guns from Caldwell shows that he is starting to prepare for whatever that is foreseen. What seems at odds at this point is that we know that there is an epidemic in 1895, and we know that Dr. Jones and Madame Laveau have foreseen the calamity that would ensue. But why would an illness require guns? Perhaps Dr. Jones predicted that an epidemic could lead to lawlessness, or perhaps one of the earlier theories about the purpose of the indecipherable language is correct. That this epidemic is organized in some form, either that it is being created by an organization, or the epidemic creates a changing character of people that becomes dangerous and coordinated, requiring those who are not affected to take suitable measures to protect themselves. With Caldwell's letter, it's also interesting how desperate he is to prove himself, which makes me wonder wonder, what was he willing to do for the AHA that others wouldn't? Maybe Caldwell is the one who made this whole epidemic slash event get much worse with his experimenting. It's quite clear he's willing to do anything to stand out and make a name for himself. And his language used in the letter is very interesting, especially the way he describes the shipment being an unusual character. Personally, I think there's more to Caldwell's activity than it appears. He's not just a good weaponsmith. He's clearly willing to make things people have never seen before to stand out, and quite clearly from the annotation given at the bottom, Caldwell is a big member of the AHA later on, so what did he provide them with, and was he truly coming up with weapons and experimental things that no one had done before that made him stand out so much? The following pages include two journal entries, the first by Alessandro Guiardini and the second by Abdullah bin Abdulaziz. They seem to be connected, so we will look at both of them together. The first journal entry starts. 2nd of February, 1895. The addictive nature of hunting ever more dangerous game is getting to me. A thrilling game of wits, followed by a showdown of a nature most glorious. I feel like I was born to do this. I have hunted all manner of beasts until now. Tigers, crocodiles, elephants, but absolutely nothing truly satisfied me. For the prey was all simply acting by instinct rather than thought. Mere beasts, too easy to predict, too easy to kill. When I became a member of the esteemed hunting lodge of the Saint Leopold, I told myself this finally, was what I was looking for, making prey out of the most accomplished hunter in this world, hunting people instead of animals. But there's no glory in shooting game a few feet from its cage. There was a true skill involved. I have briefly considered becoming a lawman, a bounty hunter, traveling to the fabled wild west and tracking criminals, but no. Criminals by their very nature ought to be stupid. 
I have no interest in measuring wits with the dumb. Precisely that is why I can't wait to reach New Orleans. This first open hunt is my chance to impress Dr. Jones and hopefully qualify for better hunting parties in the future. The society understands what a hunter actually needs. A real hunter needs no prey, for prey may, by definition, never hope to win. Therefore, since the hunter would never lose, there is no actual skill involved. Nay, a hunter needs a demon, for lack of a better term. A true hunter needs another true hunter. Let the games begin. Don Alessandro Guardini. The second journal entry continues. It is the 19th day of the Shawal month of the year 1312. We shall begin in the name of him who's most gracious and merciful. We have just arrived in this strange land of heathens. Our feet still think they're on water, even though our mind knows and cherishes the existence of firm land underneath. Despite numerous storms on our way, we weren't concerned with our own well-being. For Shingame predicted by death on land. Although we know his majesty Azriel alone knows where and when our life shall be taken, we know Shingame Shane's deck is not to be ignored. Sinners they may be, but fools they are not. As it was brought to our attention before the journey, the heathen vessel was dirty and uncomfortable. This was our first journey to their new York. It looks uglier than the old York. It is not worth anyone's attention. The master of the caravan assured us that our stay here will be a short one. Tomorrow we shall be on our way to New Orleans, if God wills it. There we shall find and slay a southern djinn of thirst and filth. Its husk shall be sold to the tribe of American hunters in exchange for 40 cars of the true deck. May God forgive our sins. Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, master of treasury. These journal entries have both been written by people traveling to New Orleans to hunt and both have been invited. However, these two people don't seem to be particularly similar to each other in the slightest. Alessandro Guardini appears to be quite disturbed and probably has been invited because of this reason. We can also deduce from his letter that Dr. Jones has invited him to hunt people rather than typical prey. Abdullah appears to be lured somewhat reluctantly to New Orleans by the promise of hunting a jinn. And I think here is where we get the piece of information that finally ties all of the information that we have gathered so far together. A jinn in Middle Eastern folklore is a spirit that can appear as a human or as an animal, but crucially for this, I think, it can possess people. Abdullah describes the spirit as being of thirst and filth, so definitely not as friendly spirit. But could this actually be the epidemic? Both journals are dated 1895. 1312 in the Islamic calendar converts to 1894-5 in the Gregorian. So this puts these hunts contemporary with the epidemic. We have seen mention of demons and predictions of the city's end and of strange writing around the city, plus a requirement of experimental guns. Now let's move quickly on to the next page to see what that can add. The next note is written by Christopher Palella Jr. and it does confirm what we have deduced so far that the Louisiana event is about hunting possessed individuals who appear to be suffering from an epidemic, but it adds more context to Dr. Jones's theories. My suspicions were proven justified today. The telegram says it's not a simple infection. Jones suspects it's a single entity making monsters of men. We probably have a sculptor on our hands. But if the doctor's right somehow, this one's able to possess and shape multiple people. Several things to consider. Can it possess inanimate objects? That poltergeist case of 86 was certainly not pleasant. Where is the seat of power? Where is its heart? What's the bounty for a brood monster such as this? A circle? If it can possess anyone, that means anyone can be the demon. This means no one can be trusted. We do not know yet how articulate this entity is. However, this also means there will be an inexhaustible supply of things to hunt, each with its own contract. I hope. Good. It's been a while, and it feels so good to be back. Let's get started. Christopher Palella Jr. So here, Palella has given us a lot more insight into what this demon is doing. We now know that it can possess multiple people at once and that it does not discriminate over who it can possess. It also seems that Dr. Jones is enticing particularly disturbed individuals with a desire to hunt without much moral debate. Is Dr. Jones purposefully attracting these hunters to deal with the demon or is he genuinely trying to provide a justification for hunting people rather than prey?
The next page features a letter written in German. Now I'm not going to embarrass myself by reading it in German, but I have had the letter translated and I'll read that instead. Your Grace, a few weeks have now passed since my last letters and I regret to report that my research into Lion Shield Regiment on their former battlefields continue to be unsuccessful. In search of the stolen regiment diary, I reached the shores of Great Lakes on the first of the month. And here too, I was unsuccessful. As the Lord would have it, the encounter with a kite opened a new trail that leads south into the swamps of Louisiana. The worrying stories I have heard about what happened in this godforsaken place once again suggest to me that more than just the diary was lost. I will be turning my back on Chicago in the next few days and for this reason purchase passage on the Union Pacific Railway to St. Louis. From there a steamboat will carry me further south across the Mississippi. I pray the virgin whose name the city bears will give me a clue to successfully complete my quest. Your most humble servant, Redmeister H. This letter on first appearances seems really out of place with the rest of the documents gathered in this scrapbook. However, there are clues that tie into the rest of the evidence. The letter is written by Rittmeister H, and a Rittmeister used to be a rank in the German army, equivalent to a captain. And indeed, it is the theft of a military logbook that has brought this Rittmeister to the US. At first, he searches for the logbook around the Great Lakes before receiving a clue that changes his course to Louisiana. Unfortunately, I'm not well versed enough in American geography to be able to say for certain which city the Rittmeister is referencing, but I do at least know that the Mississippi does pass through both Baton Rouge and New Orleans, which places him where the center of the Louisiana event takes place. But what was the evidence that he found that led him to change his journey in the first place? Well, I think we might find the answer in the earlier evidence, remembering the note from V. Caldwell that was found in the French-German dictionary in the Berlin Library. We had wondered how it had ended up there, and now we have a German captain having some sort of document that led him to Louisiana. Well, I think that the letter from Caldwell is that document. But why would Caldwell's letter cause the Rittmeister to change plans? Was Caldwell involved somehow in the logbook's theft? And if he was, then why? Did the logbook contain information that Caldwell used for his experiments with guns? And what, if anything, does the Rittmeister actually have to do with the Louisiana event, Dr. Jones and the demon that is possessing everyone? Whatever it is, we now have evidence of four people having traveled to Louisiana. Alessandro Guardini, Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, Christopher Pellella Jr. and this Rittmeister. On the next four pages, we have three tickets, all which have their destination recorded as New Orleans. The first ticket was issued to an R. Ramsey and A. Lynch, who were traveling from Cincinnati. The second ticket was notably one way with no luggage on the Georgia Railroad, issued to a Henry something. I can't quite make out his last name. And finally, there is a ticket to New Orleans from a Gus March from Buffalo, New York. This is the only one with a specific year printed on it, showing that he too was in New Orleans in 18. 95. The tickets don't give us any more information other than these are four people who traveled to New Orleans. They do not give us any reason why, but we can probably deduce that their inclusion in this scrapbook means that they must have seen some connection to Dr. Jones and the Louisiana event, and maybe they were more hunters to this game. The final page of the scrapbook features a poster for Rawlings Vaporizing Inhaler for coughs, asthma, deafness, headache, colds, and all throat bronchial and lung troubles. The only advertised remedy endorsed by the medical profession. Price, $2. With four months supply, enough to cure the most chronic case. Send COD if desired. Established 1882. Consultation and tests free at office. Ladies waited on by Mrs. Rawlings. J.R.A. Rawlings, 42 Rue Dauphine S. Now, at first, I thought this seemed very out of place compared to what else has been included in the scrapbook. But seeing that it is unlikely to be in there by accident, I've come up with a theory as to why it has been included and its relevance to the Louisiana event. At first, I had two theories. The first being that this could be something to cure symptoms of the so-called epidemic. But then when rereading, I noticed it had been around since 1882, which made me think that my second theory was more likely, that this vaporizing inhaler is how the demon 
Satan is possessing people. Whether intentionally or on purpose, I'm not so sure, but I think we can be certain that deafness and asthma can't be cured in four months, so it certainly isn't a real medical device. This could be a way of answering Palella's question of how the demon is possessing multiple people, but this is just my best guess as to why this advertisement has been included at all. So I'd be really interested to know what your thoughts are as to why it's here and indeed what you think. And after seeing all of the evidence in the scrapbook, what is the Louisiana event actually all about? In the end, it's quite plain to see that this scrapbook shows that Hunt's whole origin is set within 1895. Every bit of evidence seems to focus on that specifically, and to some, they saw this coming years before it happened. The infection seems to be caused by weird medical practices or experiments by certain individuals. Maybe it was a way for the rich individuals to justify their lusting for hunting humans over prey, or maybe it really was something that was an accident. But it also doesn't rule out the more spiritual side to things, which could explain the whole idea of the dark side used within the game. Maybe the djinn is playing a much bigger part in this world than it would first seem. And by the look of that image on the advertisement for the inhaler, I would not be surprised if this whole infection and outbreak was caused by some spirit inhabiting these medical devices, or even a really bad case of yellow fever that made people turn into absolute demons. However, saying that, seeing some of the actual creatures roaming about the land of Louisiana, it's safe to say there are, there are more paranormal things going on within this world, or even more experimental things that the German army wanted shutting down, or the AHA had involvement in. To me personally, I believe this whole event is much darker than it might seem, and would put the AHA at the heart of it. Whilst I believe that there was an epidemic in the area that triggered all of it, I personally think it was all manipulated and altered to create horrific beasts and infected to allow certain individuals, likely their rich, influential clients, to go and hunt them and have a bit of fun like Guardini, for example. This is all evident to me due to the mysterious deaths, their logo in graffiti, the letters talking about experimental weapons, voodoo magic, and even those at the top trying to shut down any news of bad things happening within the bio area. The fact that the members had access to the insane asylum as well due to family links means they had a perfect group of people to experiment on, and maybe whatever influential thing they use, be it a djinn or something more terrifying, it had the perfect host to turn into pure killing machines and deadly humans to go and kill. To me, it would also seem that the AHA appealed to the hunters' needs and attracted them to this area depending on what they wanted to hear. Guardini with his lust for killing intelligent equals and with Abtuala wanting to shut down people he believed to be heretics to honour his god. Maybe the event in question wasn't actually the infection or anything like that. It was an actual event where people turned up and did the hunt for people and monsters. But despite that, to summarise, I think this whole event was triggered by the AHA in some way. I think their experiments on the humans of the bio allowed them to satisfy their members' needs, allowing them to hunt extremely deadly beasts, infected humans, and other hunters, all without the worry of repercussions. Because let's be honest, the ones at the top of society didn't care what was happening in this part of the world. Ultimately, they saw them as undesirables. So why would law and order step in if they were to be hunted down and a big battleground was to take place? But it is all speculative and going through this notebook, even though it's not officially in the game now, has been so interesting and made me want to explore the world of Hunt Showdown even more. Hopefully this will pique your interest and I'll see you out there hunting creatures and other hunters as well. But do let me know what your theories are in the comments below. And with that, I want to say a huge thank you for watching this video and checking out the channel. I also want to give a huge shout out to my supporters on YouTube and Patreon who help me keep afloat and make these videos on a regular basis, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Greg, my YouTube channel, Wise One, Sith Lord 906, Video Gamer 75, Ico the Wolf and Havoc, my sharks, Alfred Correa, Jason X117 and Wow Search Gaming, and my Megalodons, Sinus, Hazy Thoughts, Bad Clams 83, and Connor Grohl. But that is all for now. Thank you for watching again. If you want to support this channel, all the links are down below, including the links to the audio versions on Spotify and Apple Music. And if you did enjoy this, please do like, comment, and subscribe to help get them out there. And finally, with all of that said, I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.